So what we're going to look at now is this is quite an abstract idea of is, is the abstract idea of heat content. Now, heat content. There's a few other words that are, I guess, interchangeable with the with the phrase heat content. So we can replace the phrase heat content with we can call heat content chemical energy. Or we can refer to heat content as as this interesting word called enthalpy. But first we'll go into what exactly these words mean. What is heat content? Well, heat content or chemical energy refers to the sort of inherent amount of energy in a particle. So And it, it's the energy that is inherent in a particle. So if we have, if we have, for example, two molecules, if we have one molecule of oxygen, if we draw the correct chemical structure, one molecule of oxygen and one molecule of hydrogen, each of these has a different heat content. Now, the reason for heat content Heat content is a, or chemical energy is a result of both the kinetic energy of a particle as well as the intrinsic or sort of often electrostatic energy of a molecule. So in this case, let's assume both our molecules are still, they don't have any kinetic energy. However, as a result of their different electric, electrostatic composition, so the oxygen molecule has different number of protons and electrons and different arrangements of all those electrons to that the, the arrangement of the hydrogen molecule and as a result of that oxygen will have a different chemical energy to hydrogen so it's the same way as maybe if we have a banana if we have a straightforward banana and we have an apple forgive my apple drawing but if we have if we have a banana and an apple and the banana and the apple weigh the exact same thing uh, they will have different amounts of energy. So we might eat a banana and gain a certain amount of energy from that, a, a certain amount of kilojoules for our body to use as energy from eating the banana. But if we eat an apple that has the same mass as the banana, then we will get a different number of kilojoules. We'll get a different amount of energy from that. So heat content is kind of that same idea. It's the idea of the amount of energy that is sort of intrinsic or inherent within this molecule. So if we have an oxygen molecule just sitting there by itself, it sort of contains a certain amount of energy, and that energy is what we refer to as heat content. Now, when a reaction occurs, we know that there is kind of a two-stage reaction. We start off with, in the example of oxygen, of the reaction between oxygen and hydrogen to produce water. We start off with We start off with, obviously, our oxygen molecule and two hydrogen molecules. And the first step is that energy is absorbed and these bonds are broken. And so we end up with all of these atoms that aren't bonded. And the next step we know is that energy is released and new bonds are formed. And so we get to water molecules. So this stage where the bonds are broken constitutes an absorption of energy or an increase in the energy of all of our particles. And this stage here where new bonds are formed constitutes a decrease in energy. Now, although energy is gained and then energy is lost again, the energy that we gain may be different to the amount of energy that we lose. So if we gain, we might gain maybe 100 kilojoules here but then when the new bonds are formed, we might only lose 50 kilojoules. And that means that in the end, the total heat content of our two water molecules is going to be 50 kilojoules greater than the total heat content or the total energy content of the, our reactant molecules. So this is what we mean by chemical energy. If we, so when, when the bonds break, we might absorb a certain amount of energy. And when the bonds, when new bonds are formed, we will release an amount of energy different to this. And so the, the, the difference in the, between the amount of energy we absorb and the amount of energy that we release 
is what we refer to as the change in enthalpy of the entire reaction, the change in the chemical energy or the difference in chemical energy between our reactants and our products. So enthalpy is often referred to as, often denoted by H. And so our enthalpy refers to the amount of inherent energy. And so if we release less energy than we absorb, then that means our product molecules have more enthalpy than our reactant molecules. And so we can analyze the, the way in which the difference in energies between our reactants and our product molecules. And we represent this change in energy by delta H. So if we have this delta H sign, this delta H refers to the change in enthalpy. And there are two possibilities, there are two different reaction types depending on the value of delta H. We can have delta H being less than zero, which means that energy is lost. It means that uh, the amount of energy in our, react in our products is in fact less than the amount of energy in our reactant. So that would mean that so the delta H is the difference between the energy of our products and the energy of our reactant. So we can go the enthalpy of our products minus the enthalpy of our reactants. And so if delta H is less than zero, it means that on a whole, through, the, through this entire reaction, energy has been lost. So this means that we've had a loss of energy and we refer to this type of reaction as exothermic. So just like when we, when we say that we exhale air, we breathe air out. If a reaction is exothermic, it means it's sort of breathing energy out. It's releasing energy. So that's how we remember exothermic. Now, if delta H is more than zero, if delta H is a positive number, then we know that, uh, then we know that our, react, our products have more energy than our reactants, and that means energy has been gained. And so we refer to this type of reaction as an endothermic reaction. And so we can show these changes of energy, this absorption of energy to break all the bonds, and this release of energy to create new bonds on, what we, on, a, on a special type of diagram called an energy profile diagram. So although we can measure the change in heat content, so if we burn maybe some oxygen, uh, if we burn, not oxygen, if we burn some petrol, then we know that energy will be released. And so that energy that is released is equal to the, the difference in chemical energy between the products and the reactants. So that means that by measuring the amount of energy released by a reaction, we can measure the difference in chemical energy between our reactants and our products. However, we, can in, we cannot actually measure just simply the amount of energy of, of a certain particle. So if we have an energy profile, an energy profile looks like this. So we have energy on the, on the vertical axis and an axis on the horizontal that we can sort of refer to as time. And so what we do is because we can't actually measure the chemical energy of an oxygen particle, we, however, we can actually measure the, the difference in chemical energies between two water molecules and two hydrogen molecules and an oxygen molecule. We can measure the difference in energy between our product and our reactants. We can measure that difference by calculating the amount of energy released or absorbed when this reaction occurs. But we can't actually look, we can't look at an oxygen molecule and say this molecule has a certain amount of energy. And so what that means is that on our energy profile diagram, we have no vertical axis scale. We simply have an abstract origin or an abstract starting point which represents the energy of our reactants. And then what we have is we have an increase in energy as the bonds are broken, as energy is absorbed by our particles. And then as bonds are formed in our reactant, in our sorry, in our product particles, energy is then released. And then depending on whether or not our delta H is greater than or less than zero, the, the line representing the energy of our products will be higher or it will be lower than the line representing the energy of our reactants. So if we have an exothermic reaction where energy is lost, then we know that the energy of our products will be less than the energy of our reactants. And that means we do in fact have a graph that's going to look like this. However, if we have an endothermic reaction, if energy is gained, that means the energy 
of our products is going to be greater than the energy of our reactants. And we're going to have a graph that looks like this. And so while we can't actually measure the axis or the scale of the vertical axis, we can measure these differences. If we know the activation energy of a reaction, then we will know the difference between the difference in energy between this point here and this point here. So for example, we're going to draw an energy profile diagram for the combustion of methane. Now the activation energy for the combustion of one mole of methane is 104 kilojoules and the change in enthalpy is in fact negative 889 kilojoules. So because the delta H is zero, we know that the reaction is exothermic and energy is being released. So if we wanted to draw this as an energy profile diagram, then we would have a graph that looked like this. So we know that in a combustion reaction, we have our methane reacting with our oxygen. So that is the energy of our reactants, which just make this slightly higher so that our diagram looks a little bit better. So we've got methane and we've got oxygen. And we know that energy is absorbed. In fact, 104 kilojoules of energy is absorbed as the activation energy. And then that we have an exothermic reaction, so the energy of our products is less than the energy of our reactant. So it's down here like this. We know that the products of a combustion reaction are carbon dioxide and water. So while we can't give number values for you know maybe this point on the axis, we can't say the amount of energy, the amount of enthalpy of carbon dioxide and water, we can say that we know the difference between these points here. So we know that the difference between the energy of our reactants and the energy of our products is going to be 889 kilojoules. And similarly, we know that the uh, activation energy is the difference between the top of this peak here and the energy of our reactants. So this is clearly not quite to scale. The, the height from the difference in height between the reactants and the activation energy should be less than the difference between the reactants and the product. So we should redraw this so it looks more like this. So we had a small increase, and this increase was equal to that increase was equal to 104. Kilojoules. So we could obviously improve the scale of this much better by drawing it a lot bigger and showing a much bigger difference between carbon dioxide and water. So we could change this slightly so that we're not going to redraw these numbers here, but if we wanted to get it to scale, or if we wanted to get a slightly bigger scale, we'd start up here, then we'd have a small rise in the active, as the activation energy is absorbed, and then a decrease in energy due to the exothermic nature of this reaction. So that's a bit about heat content. It's about this abstract concept of heat content, and that is how we draw an energy profile. We show the difference in energy. We can show the activation energy by showing the difference between the energy of the reactants and the peak of this point here. And we can show the difference in energy between our reactants and our products. So that is how energy profiles work.